All right, everybody, here we go. Early Roman review. The other podcast or YouTube pretty much takes care of everything else. This is what is going on in early Rome. And as the Greek classical civilization fails, we get a new empire rising in the Mediterranean with ancient Rome. The first Romans, however, um, are going to be enslaved by two groups, the Etruscans to the north and the Greeks down here to the south. And after years of being enslaved, the Greeks will learn some valuable skills. From the Etruscans, they learned how to build um, the Roman arch that they will later perfect the things that I, I told you guys about. And from the Greeks, how to drain swampy, marshy land to use for agriculture. Well, after several, about 300 years in slavery, they rebelled and defeated the Etruscans to the north. And then they turned and they went south and they fought King Pyrrhus of, of Greece. And while the Greeks won, the victory is known as a Pyrrhic victory because it was won at too great of, of a cost. The Greeks won, but it cost so many men they eventually left. And in 509 BC, the Greeks finally are in charge of the Italian peninsula. They form their own culture. And they said, we're never going to be ruled by a king ever, ever, ever again. And this is um, a big help, because Italy, if anywhere um, is suited for ruling an empire based on three continents, it's Italy. Um, the plains are very fertile, so they have a great growing season. Um, except for the, the um, spinal column, the Apennine Mountains in, in the middle, it's pretty um, easy to travel up, up and down, north and south. So it makes sense to, that the Italy was much more unified than Greece was because of its geography. And the city of Rome sits on seven hills, seven miles up the Tiber River, and so it is perfectly suited for um, defense. And so after getting rid of the Etruscans and the Greeks, the Romans form a new government, a republic, something known as a thing of the, the people. And there were two distinct social classes in ancient Rome. About 5% of the population were wealthy patricians. They were the upper crust, the rulers of the society. And they will form a government known as the Senate, run by 300 of the richest, most wealthy people in ancient Rome. And once you got a seat in the Senate, you held that position for a lifetime. That meant that 95% of the population were what was called plebeians, or a second-class citizen. Farmers, artisans, merchants, whomever. This is um, how it is, all the way down to the homeless people. So while we are a thing of the people, we're governed by the rich guys. Now, in the Roman Senate, every year they would elect two of their members to be Roman consuls. They were the executives of the Senate. They were the guys that carried out the day-to-day -day operations. Um, you know, one served as like, you know, the foreign affairs president. The other one was the internal affairs president. And they looked, um, their job was to make sure everything was getting done and they still had to report to the Senate, saying that you guys are entrusted with a lot of power, but you work for the people. And these, excuse me, consuls, <coughs> oh wow, these consuls have a lot of power. Number one, um, they are elected. And so they've got to be special. There's a reason why people elect them. Number two, they serve a term limit. They can only serve one year, and this is to prevent somebody from grabbing on and keeping the reins of power. They were commander-in-chief of the Roman armed forces. Number um, three or four is that they had veto power over each other. If one of them was doing something the other one didn't like, they could immediately veto it. And so what you've got to do is you've got to choose two people who can work together, who can be conciliatory, who can compromise, because you don't want two guys butting heads. You don't want Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton as your consuls because nothing would get done. And if you look at the um, president's um, powers here in the United States, 
Um, no office was studied more closely by the founding fathers than the office of Roman consul. Instead of having two consuls, we have a president and a vice president, but some of their um, powers mirror each other. In times of great crisis, the Romans could elect a dictator, someone to, to solve the crisis. They had unlimited power for six months or until the crisis was passed. The most famous of which is a guy named Cincinnatus who was out plowing his field, um, doing his job, when one of the consuls got surrounded by barbarians up in Gaul, today France. Without being there, Cincinnatus was elected the dictator. He comes back, tells everybody to grab their weapons and their armor. They go up, they save the consul without shedding one drop of blood. And when it's all done, Cincinnati simply comes back and gives the power back to the Senate. He becomes the role model for many great Roman um, leaders. And so this is how Rome um, sits for several hundred years. And in this time, they conquer other areas um, around them. What is today? Austria, part of Switzerland, you know, France and Spain. And these European people who were conquered benefited from conquest. Most of them were allowed to trade with the Romans. Um, some of them were protected by the Roman legionnaires. And some got the all-important gift of Roman citizenship. And an unwritten rule happens where the armies were able to keep the land that they conquered. So instead of coming back and having a few acres in Rome, you have a few thousand on the Mediterranean coast. And Rome does this. They literally build a shield of retired legionnaires around their empire. In order to get to Rome, you've got to fight through seasoned trained armies who are trying to protect their own homesteads. And eventually, as Rome expands around the Mediterranean, they come into contact with a sister empire down in Carthage. Carthage was an old Phoenician trading outpost, and what Rome wore up was to the northern rim of the Mediterranean. Carthage was to the south end of the Mediterranean. And Roman expansion will kick off a series of, of three wars no, known as the Punic Wars. And in round one, the Carthaginians lose after some tough, hard-fought battles, and they're forced to give up the island of Sicily, Corsica, and Sardinia. They were real close to Italy, and they kind of draw a dividing line in the Mediterranean. You don't mess with the northern part, and we won't mess with the southern part. But the Romans make a mistake as they capture the defeated king Hamilcar. They treat him terribly by stripping him naked and dragging him, humiliating, humiliating him through the city before he finally dies. This makes an enemy of Rome out of his young son, Hannibal. And over this long 120-year period, the Second Punic War is the most devastating. Um, the, uh, um, Hannibal will spend nearly 20 years putting an army together with which he will invade Rome by going over to the sister city of Carthage, Cartagena, marching up the Spanish coast over the Pyrenees Mountains through the Alps and descending upon Rome from the north. He even brought some war elephants with him, but many of them um, perished crossing the high Alps, the, 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 the tow rope story I told you guys. Well, near the end... Hannibal um, sends for his brother, um, who's going to follow the same route 15 years later, and he is, his brother is defeated by the Romans. Hannibal has a choice either to attack Rome or go home and defend his um, home city-state. He chooses to do so, but he loses. But the Romans said, you can fool us once, but not twice. Rather than humiliate Hannibal like his dad... They allow him to live and become a governor as long as he promises to be um, good, never to raise an army against Rome. And Hannibal says, sure, no problem, of course. But his dad made him take an earlier oath. Um, and the oath was to be an enemy of Rome forever. So as soon as they leave, um, he begins putting an army back together. The Romans find out, they come after him, and Hannibal will commit um, suicide rather than be captured. 
Um, shortly thereafter, there was a Roman Senate named Cato who ended every speech in the Senate by saying Carthage must be destroyed. Carthage must be destroyed. And finally, after years and years and years of this, and you know what, just go ahead and do it. Cato had a lot of his villas and, and plantations destroyed, so he hires a general named Scipio to go down and defeat the already conquered Carthaginians. And the Carthaginians go and do this, um, and as the Romans show up, sorry, little distract it out, out in the hallway there, it's amazing how much work people don't get done on a day like this. Um, the Carthaginians are like, dude, what's up? You've already conquered us. And Scipio says, well, yeah, but we're here to kill all the men, women, or kill all the soldiers and enslave the women and the, the children. So they fight a third in a climactic battle um, on the plains of Zarma, and the Carthaginians lose. And to show what happens when you mess with Rome, the Romans will take the women and children, and they will fill up barges and barges of salt from the North African coast. They will take it back, and they will dump it on all the fertile farmland in and around Carthage. The furrows that were dug for the planting, like 12 inches of salt were dumped in them. Now this is significant because salt at the time was the ancient world's refrigerator. You could not really survive without it, and salt was really... Um, worth as much, if not more so, than gold. Salaries were actually paid in salt at this time. And so what the Romans did was waste literal billions of dollars of salt just to prove a point. This is what happens when you mess with us. It's the salt the earth policy. When this happens, Rome switches from a tiny regional kingdom to a massive worldwide empire. I call this the beginning of the, it's the imperial star system. Rome now calls the Mediterranean Sea Mare Nostrum, which means our sea. Every bit of land that touches um, the Mediterranean now belongs to us. And this causes a mental switch in the Romans as governing a massive multicultural empire is much different than their regional kingdom. And because those Carthaginians were so tough to defeat, the Romans switch. The newly conquered peoples don't get the right to trade and citizenship and protection. They will be subjugated. A Roman governor will be sent there by the Senate to collect taxes and ensure the peace. Right? His, these governors have no real limits on their power. Armies will be sent to occupy. All right? We're an occupational force keeping our eye on, on you. And the conquered people are forced to pay what is tribute. Tribute is where you take what you make or you grow and you send most of it to Rome. You keep just enough to survive upon. So Rome becomes this massive extractive empire where they take a straw, this milkshake <laughs> philosophy or um, example I, I gave you guys, where they suck out your resources. And so Rome will begin to exist on this tribute, so Romans don't have to pay taxes. They're existing on all this tribute pouring into the, the empire, and this makes some people extremely rich and wealthy. They're able to buy up businesses, they're able to buy up farmland, and create these enormous things known as latifundias. And working on a latifundia, say it with me, John and Noah, is not a lot of fun to you. And Rome now will take these conquered people and turn them into slaves. Rome is built on slave labor more so than any other empire. And so why hire somebody to do it when you can have slaves do it? And this puts Romans out of work. Farmers lose their, their land and their homes, so they flock to the city. Small shopkeepers in Rome lose their businesses. And so now we have a bunch of homelessness. Not paying taxes sound good, sounded good, but now it hurts. And so we get two reformers, members of the equestrian order, the famous Gracchi brothers, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, who resign their seats in the Roman Senate, members of the equestrian order, to govern Rome, or to run as tribune. And tribunes will be ten seats 
that the plebeians earned to get into the political process. Um, they will undergo a long, 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 long road to get political representation, starting in 12 or 450, to getting the 12 tables of law written. And after saving the patricians from barbarians, the plebeians are given 10 seats in the Roman Senate. I know, it's kind of strange. Ask for 150. They only get 10. And if all 10 of those guys vote consensus, all right, the Senate cannot pass a law uh, that will harm plebeians. Well, Tiberius Gracchus wants to limit the size of large landed estates and give them back to the poor. And this will hurt the rich people. And I said, that is a horrible idea. What are you thinking? So they invite Tiberius and 300 followers to the Senate, and they are assassinated. Ten years later, his little brother Gaius takes over, and he says, look, I don't want to take land from you guys, but let's take these Romans and give them land in the conquered areas. Like, why give them five acres here in Rome when we can give them a hundred in the conquered lands? And people are like, guys, that's a great idea. And he begins to suffer from hubris. He's like, oh, yes, I know. So the problem is he gets cocky and wants to lower the price of grain so more Romans could afford it and extend citizenship to more people. And the Senate says, we know what you're trying to do. You're trying to take power from us to get those people behind you so you can, you can hurt us. So they invite Gaius and 3,000 of his followers to the Senate, where he and his 3,000 members are also assassinated. Um, the, once again, the only people who committed the crime, who could investigate the crime, excuse me, are the ones who committed the crime. Everybody knows what happened, but the Senate thinks they have protected themselves. And what they do is they, they set the dangerous precedent of when you need to accomplish a political goal, you assassinate your leader in ancient Rome, which comes back to haunt them. So we have trouble at home uh, as a result. The farms and the money pouring in... Um, drives these poor middle-class people off their farms, as I said. Rome is dependent upon slave labor, and this causes a massive conflict between rich and poor. And seeing this go on for a while, generals will step in to take over. Generals become extremely popular, because if you fight for a successful general, you still get the land that you conquer. So soldiers begin to like draft generals, all right? It's fantasy general draft. Who do I want to fight for? Two of the most successful were a guy named Gnaeus Pompey, the old grizzled veteran, and a young guy named Julius Caesar. Um, in between, there are two guys named Marius and Sulla. Sulla was from an old Roman um, family, noble family, who had fallen on hard times. And he is sent by a guy named Marius to put down two rebellions, one in North Africa and one in Europe. And Marius will take credit for them until Saul calls him out and says, you didn't do anything. That was me and my soldiers that, that, that did it. And when Saul calls out Marius in front of the Senate, Saul is elected as consul, then eventually as a dictator. And he tried to halt and cure the ills plaguing Rome, the gap between rich and poor. And like his hero Cincinnatus, when he had things working again, he resigns and he goes into retirement. And the greedy, evil Senate goes right back to what they were doing. Zach and Alyssa just can't resist that lore and greed of money. And while this is going on, there's a massive slave rebellion led by a gladiator slave named Spartacus. And it scares ancient Rome to death. And then there's this guy, a guy named Gnaeus Pompey, or excuse me, Marcus Lucinius Crassus, who was the richest man in Rome, but he wanted to be honored as a general. So he recalls Gnaeus Pompey from Turkey and Julius Caesar from Gaul, the two most successful generals. With their help, he defeats the slave army of Spartacus, and creates what is known as the First Triumvirate. 
a rule of three. The Senate can meet, and Caesar will be elected a, as consul, but they're pretty much going to do what they're told by the first triumvir. Well, um, shortly thereafter, having three alphas in charge doesn't work. Crassus goes over to Asia Minor and gets himself killed. Caesar went back to finish conquering Gaul, Gaul where when he, if you were a strong enemy and fought against him, he would cut off the right hand of all of your warriors. Uh, um, so he's got this fearsome reputation. Well, Pompey is left home. And he was a plebeian, and he's approached by the Senate and says, Hey, we'll make you a senator for life if you can restore us to power and get rid of this Caesar guy. So in an exchange of, of uh, messages, Caesar is ordered back to Rome by himself. He can't bring his army. He's got to stand trial for treason. If his army follows him back, it will mean civil war, and his soldiers' families will be held responsible. So Caesar says, guys, i got to leave you. Oh, my God, I don't want to do this. They're like, sir, if you go, they're going to kill you. Yeah, well, probably, but I can't get you guys in trouble. They're like, heck with that, man, we're going with you. And as they cross the Rubicon River, Caesar says that he saw Rome appear to him in the vision of a, of a goddess. And if she lets him in, he and his army will protect her and keep her safe. So there is a civil war in which Julius Caesar wins chases Pompey all the way to Egypt, where the Egyptians kill him. As Caesar gets there, you remember the Cleopatra and the Persian rug story. Um, him and Cleopatra fall in love, and he spends seven years there before returning to Rome and telling the Senate, Ven, bid, bid, I have come, I have seen, I have conquered. Boys, you are going to elect me the dictator for life, and I am going to cure the ills of Rome. And Caesar was never um, uh, very conscious of the fact he never, ever, ever called himself a king. He was the dictator. And he institutes a series of reforms aimed at helping the empire um, grow. Um, he creates a public works project, much like Pisistratus of, of ancient Greece, to put the poor, unemployed Romans back to work, beautifying the city, building roads, things of that nature. He takes land from the rich, and he gives it to the poor. So now you had to own land in order to serve in the army. He grants citizenship to more people. Where there are allies, where there were disturbances, he says, hey, why don't you become citizens and work with us rather than against us? He gets rid of the corrupt officials and sends his military commanders out in the provinces, guys who knew um, Caesar knew the way he liked to get things done, and it was military chain of command, general, colonel, major, captain, first lieutenant, second lieutenant, and whiz bang, problems plaguing Rome begin to fall away, and Rome is rejuvenating, and he introduces a new calendar based on Egypt that uh, he has a new month named July for himself, like why wouldn't you, I was born in July, greatest holiday in America, July 4th is in July, so why not? But the senators get upset, and they said, my God, he's, this stuff is actually working. There's only one thing we can do, and that is we got to kill him. This guy is acting like a king. He's not even asking us what he wants done. He's just telling us what he wants done. So they finally convince one of his compatriots, a guy named Brutus, and on the way to the Forum on March 15th, 44 B.C., the Ides of March, Julius Caesar is assassinated. And it looks like Rome is going to fracture and fall apart, but Caesar left orders that his young nephew Octavian is going to take over. And Octavian is a tiny little sickly guy. He's got his glasses and his pocket protector and his slide rolling. Mom, I know. I'm sick, but by my calculations, I could be in Rome this afternoon. I have to. That's what Uncle Julius wants me to do. And Octavian was young and sickly, but he was incredibly smart. Following his uncle's instructions, he forms the second triumvirate with two loyal assistants, Mark Antony and Mark Lepidus. He forms the second triumvirate, and Octavian's power is always the army. He's got his uncle's old seasoned veteran army behind him. 
They track down the assassins and they eliminate them all. And they divide the empire into thirds. But it will only last ten quick years as Octavian hears that Mark Antony is plotting with his uncle's old squeeze, Cleopatra, um, to form a civil war and control Greece and the eastern part of, of the empire. So Octavian and Mark Antony go to war, and Octavian wins. Mark Antony will commit suicide, and Cleopatra will do so as well with the snake and the fruit basket trick. And in 31 BC, um, at the age of 32, Octavian is now master of the Roman world. Marcus Lepidus just goes to North Africa and just pretty much hangs out. At the same age of Alexander the Great, Octavian has a bigger empire. And the Senate is terrified of him. Oh man, he's really mad at us. So they give him the title of Imperator and Augustus, which means exalted one. And he's actually worshipped as a living God. And he says, look Senate, this is what you guys are going to do. And this is how you are going to do it. My uncle called himself a dictator and allowed you to vote. I'm not even going to do that. And, and Augustus now um, becomes the tr first true emperor of, of Rome. And he will kickstart a thing known as Pax Romana, a 200-year reign of peace and prosperity for ancient Rome. Um, the precedence that he will set will allow Rome to reciprocate into the future, and he pursues this thing called a make-the-world-Rome policy, where he builds smaller versions of Rome throughout the empire so people could get accustomed to and exposed to Roman technology and culture. He will also institute the famous Roman road network that stems out from Rome like the spokes on, um, on a wheel, I enjoy kind of, you know, taking those roads. They do get a little hectic around the roundabouts, but it's kind of part of the fun in the process. All right, that gets us caught up to where we were the other day. From 27 to 180 B.C. is Pax Romana, as everything from Great Britain down to Morocco, up into Turkey and southern Russia, the Caucasus Mountains, is connected under the massive Roman empire and trade flows in all right guys now watch that please do well on this and i'll see you at least tomorrow and when i return